Okay. David Baumblatt, uh, basically just tell us um, some of your biography, your background, your history, and um, your current story and where you are at today and your overall sure. message. Sure. Thank you very much. And to all the guests, thank you so much. I assume the audience is, is Americans or Westerners, so probably my story pertains to you. My name is David Baumblatt. I'm an American citizen born and raised in New York. I graduated the United States Military Academy, West Point. I served as a U.S. Army officer overseas during 9-11. In 2004, I entered the FBI as a special agent in the National Security Branch working foreign counterintelligence. I immediately, upon my arrival in the FBI, even when I was at the FBI Academy, I realized there were some major leadership discrepancies. And I saw this also in the military, and I'm seeing this now in, in the book that I've written about America, and it's entitled The Leadership Crisis. So this theme of leadership continues to come back. Yeah, I'm sure you're not a very satisfied person, my listener, to politics, to the government, whatnot. So same thing happened in the FBI. It was just very horrible leadership. And in 2007, I left the FBI. In 2007, I wrote a letter to Senator Chuck Grassley, and I told him about what I saw, the incompetencies and the immorality of the FBI. One of the main things is you might be familiar now with FBI whistleblowers, and I had joined the FBI before them, and they had joined the FBI after I left already. But what they reported, I had already reported to Senator Chuck Grassley. And even though there's many things we could talk about the FBI, the crux, the biggest crux was the FBI was and still is unconstitutionally spying on U.S. citizens without any probable cause of illegal activity. That's the crux of it. And we'll go into it later, you know, the FISA Act, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and whatever. So I left in 2007. I wrote Senator Chuck Grassley. He never responded to me. He should have, but he didn't. And I never went public for three reasons. One, I don't think anyone would believe me. Uh, there's still an overall belief, just like the government, the COVID vaccines, take your, co take your COVID shots. People just believe the government, believe these organizations. I don't think anyone would believe me, number one. Number two... Also about leadership, nobody wants to come across as a complainer. Even now, you'd be surprised as a whistleblower when you're saying, hey, I've got government allegations of corruption, I'm a whistleblower. People will still say, stop complaining, this and that. So nobody wants to listen to a complainer. And number three, the FBI is pound for pound the most powerful government agency, meaning this is not an agency you want to make enemies with. And so I, for those three reasons, however, what Senator Chuck Grassley did, though, I don't have any evidence of this. I know what he did. He, uh, he took the letter that I wrote him it was about 10 pages. And the, the letter was broken up into two parts. One about how the FBI was immorally, illegally acting. And the other part was I just ripped the FBI management. You know, I got personal. I use a lot of colorful language on just how horrible they were. <laughs> and the FBI is very vindictive. He took that, gave it to one of his staffers, and the staffers gave it to the FBI. And I've had bad blood with the FBI ever since. Very few people leave the FBI. Very few. In fact, that's another reason that a difference between me and these FBI whistleblowers, where they're called, I think, the suspendables, whereas, you know, they didn't want to quit. Uh, you know, there, there's there's fight over back pay. I didn't. I, I really wanted to quit. I had no interest in it. And I left. In 2010, and this also goes into my persona and leadership, in 2010, I left America. Why did I leave America? Why did I go to China? I'll explain. In 2005, I already started getting a feeling that America is headed to collapse. Civil war, rev revolution, whatever you want to call it, this system is going down. And later I'll explain it. And there's a leadership phrase in the military. It's called lead follow or get out of the way. We've always heard that. Picture yourself working in a corporation and your colleague sitting next to you and all he does is complain. I hate this company. I hate this company. I hate this company. So what do you do? You say, well, instead of complaining all the time, you become the CEO. You know, you become the management. Change it. Make this company better. That would be lead. Two would be follow. And that is stop complaining. Nobody wants to listen to a complainer. Be thankful that you're working in this corporation and, you know, just try to make it, you know, maybe be a better follower so that way the company does better. Or 
get out of the way. Quit, quit. Nobody wants to let. So that was lead follower, get out of the way. And I said, listen, I don't think I'm going to change America. Good luck to Donald Trump, which I think is the best president of my entire lifetime. Good luck to him. He's going to need it. Um, I'm not into following. So I said, get out of the way. Now, why did I go to China? In 2007, when I left the FBI, uh, I did a lot of master's degrees. I actually have four master's degrees. And no, I'm not advocating people go to college. I think the, you could waste a lot of your time like I did in college. So the, the leadership rule is get an education, but that doesn't necessarily mean going to academia. There's a lot of ways you could get an education in life. I went to, I did four master's degrees, not advocating it. But in 2007, I decided to do another master's degree at Harvard. I went to the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. This is 2007. And Harvard at that time was inundated with corporations. I remember Goldman Sachs. And they said, China's the future. China's the future. Go to China. I started studying Chinese Mandarin back in 1995. I read and write. I actually could pass for Chinese on the telephone. So because I was fluent in Chinese, I the the corporations they go to China, and I said I got to leave America. This place is going under, and I I decided to go to China. So in 2010, I moved to China. Talk about that later, and then the FBI started spying on me, and we'll go into that later. And then all of a sudden, what you'll realize is this is kind of insight into the FBI. When the FBI is investigating you for national security, generally speaking. There's nothing you can do. I, I say again, they're very powerful. But when I was at the FBI Academy, there's only one thing that the FBI is remotely intimidated about. And I think you remember Waco, Ruby Ridge. It's got to be an event that gets millions and millions of Americans behind it, meaning it's public, public pressure. But if it's not that, they're not intimidated. They, you're not going to get a lawyer. Nothing's going to work. So I'll go into the story later, but I tried to work it out in private. I tried to get politicians working out in private. It never, it just didn't work. And I finally realized the only thing left I have to do is to write a book and go public because, again, they were investigating me, not just in America, overseas and destroying my life. And so I was in China. And while I was in China, I worked for two corporations. This also goes into what I've learned. I worked for the Boeing Corporation. That's the military industrial complex, by the way in China. And I worked for Amazon. That's a very big corporation. Also in China. I went to China. And then I had left China because of the COVID. And then I could explain where I went and the reason it has to do with the FBI. And then I went back to what's called Hong Kong, which is China, but it's a little different uh, in terms of culture and legalities. So now I'm in Hong Kong. And what I'm trying to do is uh, the book that I wrote, it's entitled basically a warning about the collapse of America due to a leadership crisis. And what I could tell you is during my entire life in the, in the government and leadership, my thesis is, and many of you kind of get it now, I mean, it's, it's, it's really common sense, but when I was in China, it solidified it when I was in China. And that is, if you're an American patriot, and I describe that as someone who's into faith, family, and freedom, this is what we have, we're, lo we're losing our country. The biggest threat to you is not from China, it's not from Russia, it's not from the Taliban, it's not from Saddam Hussein, you know, we assassinated him. It is the American globalist corporations and the American globalist government, which works for the corporations. And no, the FBI and the CIA are not running the world. They are sort of like the henchmen, you could say, the goon squad. Like, but the people who are really the masters that have the money, the intelligence, you know, everything from BlackRock on, I mean, they, the corporations own us, they rule us. And to give you an example, when I was at the Harvard Kennedy School, there was a time I was actually thinking about running for office. In America, whether it's Republican or Democrat, whether it's at the federal level or the state level, the number one alumni of these politicians is the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. So that's the number one alumni that these politicians graduate from. So Heinz, Harvard knows a lot about politics. This is the Kennedy School of Government. So during one of my classes, and it's about how to run for office, how to become a politician. I still remember the professor at Harvard asked us, all these students, these are graduate students, probably all of us were thinking about running for office. 
And the professor asked us, what does it take to become a politician in America? What is it? And people answered, you know, you got to be smart. You got to be good at public speaking. You got to be tall. You got to be handsome. You know, all these things that people probably could guess. And he replied with, the number one thing is, how much money can you raise? And it's right. And so the point being is, it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or you're a Democrat, you need money. And you're probably getting money from the same donors. They all work for the same donors and nothing's free. So the donors, these would be the corporations, the special interest groups, they give money and they want results. They want you to do their bidding. So that's when you hear a lot of times the Republicans and the Democrats are sort of the same thing. It's true. They're, they are not, they're not that much different and they're working for their owners. And the reason that solidified this in China is whatever you think about China, and I still say China is a threat. I'm not saying China's our ally and let's welcome them, them into our country. Not at all. It's a threat. Russia's a threat. There are threats to be dealt with. But what I'm saying is I know more about China than probably, probably anyone in the government. That's how bad it is. And the point being is if you live in China like I do and you see the amount of American banks corporations, and oh, by the way, Democrats and Republicans, how they treat the Chinese government. That's not how you treat the enemy. That's how you treat your business partner, because it's all about money. And so that was probably the biggest thing I learned about China, that it's still a threat, but it's not our main enemy, because this is not how you, and oh, by the way, to anyone who still disagrees with me, if you go back to China, again, I did master's degrees too in China. If you go back to China in the 1970s or earlier, China is a very poor country. It still is in some fashions. But the point being is, is how did China develop so much? How did it grow? They didn't do it on their own. They did it through American investment. So whatever you think about this Frankenstein of this Chinese monster, whatever you have in your in mind of this growing beast, who built it? Now, obviously, we have to give credit to China. You know, they obviously deserve credit for doing it. But don't fool yourself. If it was not for the investment, the money, the know-how, the intellectual property given to them by American corporations and banks in exchange for money, that's how it works, China would never be like it is. So if you think China's evil, who built it? And we did. Maybe not you and me, citizens, but the corporations and whatnot. So that's what I would say in a nutshell to the American people. And that is, however you want to slice it and dice it, this system is going down. I'll give more examples. And it's going down because we're losing three things that made America faith. America was, and I'm not saying I'm a religious nut, but it was. There's a lot of culture in our Judeo-Christian religions, our culture. We are a European country. We're losing it, but we were founded by Europeans. There's diversity is okay, but when it gets so much, and then three are freedoms. Our freedoms are dropping. And the point is, is we could scramble this omelet anyway where you think, well, I think it should be this. I think it should be that. Let's see if it works. Because again, I think it's going to collapse. It's like, it's like you're in a corporation that is so dysfunctional, immoral, and losing money. We can argue all day long how the management should run this corporation. But at the end of the day, if it goes bankrupt, it goes bankrupt. Something didn't work. And this country, it's not going to work. And I would say to really, to really shed light on what I've learned overseas, to make it simplistic from a leadership standpoint, to really simplify this equation, just go with my logic on this. In the non-Western countries, because it's not just China, it's really non-Western countries like Russia, Saudi Arabia, India, all the, the, the world is sort of splitting into non-Western world and the Western world. If you're in the non-Western world, who has the power? The government. For example, in China, it doesn't matter if you're a billionaire. If you go up against the Chinese government, you're in a lot of trouble. I'm not saying this is good or bad. I'm just saying that's the fact. The government, same thing in Russia. The government has the power. In America, it's the corporations and the banks. Everyone knows it. It's the corporations, the <laughs> banks, the money. Whoever's got the money has the power. Anything, even, even if you're a private citizen, 
<laughs> and there's lawsuits or whatever. I mean, money, money buys influence, money. We know in America, money, money will get you, will, will get you out of a lot of trouble or get what you want. So that's the first difference. In the non-Western world, the government has the power. In the Western world, the corporations have the power. The second thing is ideology. In the non-Western world, their ideology is nationalism. China first, Russia first, India first. It's nationalism. In the Western world, despite Donald Trump saying America first, it's still globalism. Our ideology, because that's what the corporations are, they're globalists. Our ideology is globalism. So I wanted to simplify this before I hand it back, but make it real simple. And this is why it's going to go to collapse. So again, the non-Western world, governments have the power. Nationalism is the ideology. In the West, the corporations have the power. And globalism is the ideology. The point being is, is you can't have a nation, America, a nation, long term, where the ideology, the superior ideology, is globalism over nationalism. Eventually, the country will fall apart. And we've been seeing that now for decades. So that's kind of the, the synopsis right there. And if anyone doesn't believe me, we'll give them more time. But I left America in 2010. Has it gotten better or worse since then? I think it's gotten worse and it's going to continue to get worse. So I'd be happy to, you know, dive into into more specifics, but that hopefully gives a gives a start starting run. Definitely. Uh, I, I wanted to say, um, so, um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, for the people, um, anyone in the USA who's applying for like the FBI, um, et cetera, um, if you could tell them a few things, what would that be? Um, anything good, anything bad? Um, yeah, what, so. I can interpret that question a lot of ways. I, it yeah, used no to be like, tell us <laughs> how to get into the FBI. And I could say that. Obviously, I'm not really pro-government. Obviously, I quit the FBI. And, and part of the reason I quit, though, is I knew getting into the FBI is so competitive that there are thousands and thousands of people waiting. So I knew that once I decided to leave the FBI, which was about two years, I, I, I was an agent for three years, about the two-year mark, I realized, I don't know if this is so, such a right deal for me. And then I lost my motivation, and I thought to myself, it's time for me to leave. Because I know there's thousands of people that are dying to be an FBI agent that are motivated, and, you know, God bless them and let them do it. So I'll answer that in two ways. I guess the first answer is maybe, I think, are you asking how to get into the FBI, or just can well, you just uh, repeat that question? Well, uh, no. So essentially, um, some people are going to do what they're going to do. Um, yeah. And um some people still do stuff, even if it's fishy or shady, um, basically <laughs> overall, like, um, cause there's good and bad in everything, but the bad will always try and even manipulate yeah, so, that good little percentage. Sure. Um, what, uh, Here. if you could tell them anything overall, like for their safety, for the uh, civilian safety, and even, um, for like their contractual jobs, all that, it's, if, if it's good or if it's bad, like, um, just in yeah, general. So I obviously do not have a high opinion about the FBI that, you know, about my book, about not the only one. <laughs> yeah. I would literally, now there are people that want to abolish the FBI altogether. I'm not saying that, but I'm not going to stop them. Meaning there's a lot of bad blood between me and the FBI. So if somebody wants to abolish the FBI altogether and the CIA, well, I'm not going to stop them. I'm not going to object to it. But to me, first point, and I'll put the FBI and the CIA together because a lot of people don't understand the difference between how they work intelligence. Sometimes there's a rivalry. Sometimes there's a collusion. Don't fool yourself. Sometimes they work together very good against the American people. And other times, yes, there's a rivalry where they don't work with each other. But I would, on day one, I would terminate 50% of FBI agents and CIA, the whole department, 50% fired. Because, and it's similar to the military. These government departments grow, grow, grow. They want more money. They want more power. And the problem is, in the private sector, if you have a corporation or a company that is immoral, incompetent, or whatever, it should go bankrupt, generally. I mean, this is capitalism. So, you know, this company's immoral. It's, it's the government won't do that, though, because it, it's, it can never get fired. It just keeps getting your tax money and grows and grows. So it's truly possible in the government to have truly incompetent, immoral, unconstitutional agencies they continue to grow. Where in the private sector, they would have been bankrupt. So the number one, and I write this in my book, 
I would defund 50 percent. And and trust me, I defund a lot of government agencies, but I sort of focus on the FBI and the CIA because that's where I worked in both of them. But 50 percent of them defunded immediately. Then I take out a scalpel and maybe defund another 10, 20, maybe even 30 percent. But what I would defend the FBI is this. We do have foreign spies and foreign terrorists operating in America. Somebody's got to do something about it. My main issue with the FBI is how they deal with U.S. citizens. And that is also when I talk about the FISA Act and this and that. So when it comes to the FBI, when I was in the FBI, I spied on foreign nationals. I actually didn't have a problem with it from legality and morality. I, I, I didn't. It, I thought it was fine. My issue is when the FBI spies on U.S. citizens. So I find it an absolute joke in our government that says TikTok spying on you, like all this other stuff spying on you. Now, I'm not saying TikTok is not spying on you. I'm just saying as a U.S. <laughs> citizen and your tax money is being paid to the U.S. government, my first question is, why is the CIA, the FBI, the NSA spying on me, number one? Like, let's let's first work on that, and then we'll work on Russia or China spying on us. So in terms of the FBI, what I would say is this, you know, just some legal advice. You probably heard it, never talk to cops. I just wouldn't deal with the FBI. I mean, there, there could be a situation where, you know, the FBI works sometimes cases that are noble, you know, kidnapping, your daughter gets kidnapped and, you know, the FBI says, hey, we're here to, you know, help you bring back your daughter. And they do. And, you know, thank you very much. But generally speaking, I believe it's turned into a force of wrong than a force of good. It's just changed. Even the American government, you know, we all know those Star Wars movies, you know, Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker. Remember the Rebel Alliance? They're the good guys. And the Empire, Darth Vader's the bad guys. Trust me, when you start going overseas, America's changed. We, we are the empire now. We're Darth Vader, meaning we go to, you know, bombing countries. We're, we're as much as we like to think we're the good guys. So our government's changed to include the CIA and the FBI. And I focus on them because they just have a lot of power. So I'd say number one is generally I wouldn't trust them. I just I would not trust them. Two, I am totally in favor of defunding them. And three, I, I keep saying before you're worried about a foreign threat, and you're seeing it. This is Leadership 101. It's always a foreign threat. Remember Saddam Hussein, weapons of mass destruction? Remember the Taliban? I mean, let's use common sense. We did this war on terror for 20 years because of the Taliban. Well, we lost. We pulled out. The Taliban are still there. So where's the threat? Well, we still should be afraid of the Taliban. Ah, forget it. We made enough money. Let's go to Ukraine. Let's go to Taiwan. Let's go to Israel. So the threat is always overseas. But really, the biggest threat you'll find is is domestic, and that is the globalist government, the globalist corporations. And before I end, I'll, and before your next question, is just remember, the FBI is approved to build a brand new headquarters. It's going to be bigger than the Pentagon. I say again, doesn't matter how incompetent and moral you are in the government, you grow. Who do you think the FBI is going after? The FBI is primarily domestic and sec even though it is it's so globalist but still it's still primarily domestic so they're probably going to go after u.s citizens so you're telling me they're building a brand new headquarters that's bigger than the pentagon more people more power and to all these citizens which i don't agree with this whole back to blue back law enforcement back to blue back to i don't back them one day you keep back in the fbi back in law enforcement one day you're going to be arrested by these tyrants, <laughs> and you're going to eat your words. But I, I don't back the blue. I think it's time to defund the police, without a doubt. Uh, w would you say, um, theoretically or whatever, um, that there is um, uh, maybe um, people creating their own problems to give jurisdiction? Yeah, so you, you got to remember, one of the reason I left the government, I wanted to make a career in the government because I thought the government was different than the private sector. So, you know, growing up, I was like, private sector, it's greedy, 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 money, money, money. Government, it's all about honor. You know, we're not about values. Same thing because it, we're fused. The government and the corporation are the same. And so the point is they want to grow. Now, remember, the intelligence community, the law enforcement community, the military community, basically the security, the, 
the, the military security industrial complex, however you want to call it. No threat, no budget. So every time, every year they go to Congress and they do a briefing, they cannot say, well, everything seems to be safe. I mean, I'm going to give you an example. If domestic terrorism was so important, the FBI would have that border sealed. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you could look at J. Edgar Hoover how you want, and he was a tyrant. Under his reign, he was a nationalist. That border would be sealed. So the FBI, have you ever heard of the FBI director really talk about the southern border is open? I mean, we got people just coming in, coming in, coming in. You don't think we're going to have a terrorist attack? We're probably going to have another terrorist attack. And just like 9-11, the FBI is going to say, well, we need to do a new improved Patriot Act because danger. And once that terrorist act happens, people are going to be afraid. Fear. Fear is like part of leadership. It's a great way to manipulate people. There's going to be a new terrorist attack, and we're going to get a new Patriot Act, and there goes your freedoms. Where you probably should have said, why don't we close the southern border? But like I said, no threats, no attacks. Then why do we need an FBI? Why do we need CIA? Why do we need a military? So these boogeymen that, that need to come up, they keep the gravy train coming. They do. It's, it, it's so obvious. Like I said, just look at the military. We got out of Afghanistan. That was a complete and utter failure. Nobody got fired. Nobody apologized. And we didn't skip a beat. We went straight to Ukraine. Now we're going to Israel. Now we're going to, we don't skip a beat. Why? Because the money, you know, Bo <laughs> Boeing, Raytheon, Lockheed, the military, they need profits. I mean, you got to remember, what if you open up a restaurant? You got to keep the burgers flipping every day. You got kids to feed. You can't really close down your restaurant too long. Otherwise, how do you pay the bills? These defense corporations are the same way. They got to keep pumping out armaments. And when there's a war, even we don't have to fight in the war. We can allow the Ukrainians to do the fighting and they could just supply them with, with the armaments. So that way the industrial complex still gets their money. You know, we, we still pay for Boeing to send Ukraine all the armaments, the, you know, the, the fighter jets, the missiles, whatever you want it. But war is business. And it's just so obvious now. And so, like I said, sooner or later, because we hear, we hear the Hollywood movies all the time that America, we're the good guys, we're the good guys. But we have really turned into a force of evil in the world. And my foreign policy is probably this, because I'm a nationalist. It's probably time to spend more of our money and our attention domestically helping us out. And a lot of these overseas conflicts or issues, let those other countries deal with them. Because we don't have the money anymore or that we don't have the blood and treasure. But so, I, yeah. like I said, I, I think eventually it's going to collapse, though. Yeah, I, I was going to say um, on top of everything, um, there's a lot of invasive technologies advancing and um, super sophisticated stuff. And I advise anyone to definitely look into it. Um, it makes a lot of things look really contradictful. I was going to say we are running out of time. Um, last question. If there's something you learned from your experiences overall, like all the trials and tribulations you've been through. Um, what would that be? And uh, what is your recommendation on life? Yeah. So when I was a cadet at West Point, West Point's known for leadership. There's this phrase called momente mora. Remember you are mortal. And I really mean that. And I, and I had that when I was younger. That's why I always took risks. But when you get older, you realize it. So to any young American boy listening, young, young American man, time flies. It really flies whether you eventually die a natural death in old age, or you may die an early death because of accident or whatnot, but always remember you're mortal, that this world, your life will come to an end. And if you can embrace that death, you can overcome a certain amount of fear. And that when you overcome that fear, you'll really be able to live your life in a sense that you're going to have your morals and principles or your faith align, because no matter what you do, most of this stuff, it's not going to matter. Like me, graduating Harvard, <laughs> nobody cares. It's not going to matter. So remember one day you're going to die, 
And by that remembrance, I think it's going to spiritually change the way you live your life just by knowing that your life is going to end one day. Right on. Uh, man, I, uh, I could say so much on it. Um, but yeah, um, overall, uh, I do want to thank you for your time. And uh, man, um, uh, no doubt. I uh, <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Yeah, I, I appreciate it. And if anyone wants to follow me, I've already been censored on YouTube. So Rumble and Twitter, just David Baumblatt, and you'll find me Rumble and Twitter. And thank you so much for the time. Yeah, likewise, David. Thank you. God bless. And I wish you well. Thank you so much. Lead to victory.